All right. Thank you all for coming to my session. Surprise, there's more people here that are not interested in data and <clears throat> and open source communities and how uh, we're able to drive developer efficiencies. I guess everybody's already completely maximized all the efficiency out of their developers already. Um, so my name's Lee Faust. I'm the global field CTO at GitLab. Um, I've been in the developer tool space for about 20 years. <coughs> I've actually been in the uh, uh, software space for 30. Um, started off as a high school teacher, um, was an adjunct professor at NC State University. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I go back to, in the developer tool space um, back to 2000. I worked for a company called Together Soft. And TogetherSoft did uh, UML, a lot of Java, J2EE, um, and then I ended up going to work for Red Hat. And between those two companies, I got really involved in the open source community. I was a huge fan. Um, I was a contributor to uh, Tomcat, early days at Tomcat, um, contributor to the Eclipse Foundation. Um, I actually, um, anybody here ever use Eclipse? Anybody here use SVN or CVS with Eclipse? Oh, all the time? So if you hated it, it wasn't me. If you loved it, it was me. So um, I actually wrote the virtual file system layer for Eclipse for all of the version control systems. Um, and I ended up running my own consulting practice uh, for about five years um, and started doing a lot of DevOps, a lot of automation, had a little bit of an operations background. I've been a CTO, a VP of engineering, and the talk I'm gonna to give today is near and dear to my heart. Um, spent four and a half years at GitHub, saw a lot of this when I was there. Now seeing it um, at GitLab a lot because at GitLab, um, there's a lot of things that we do in the open core community where the open source users and the people who run self-hosted community edition they actually will turn on the heartbeat functionality and that heartbeat functionality will send us data about their instances. And so some of the stuff I'm gonna talk about today are aggregates of things that we've learned both from the academic community as well as from our user community about how we can drive better efficiencies uh, into our enterprise organizations around developer workflows and things like that. So, Developer efficiency. Why is developer efficiency important? Well, when we go out there and we talk to our user communities, and especially to the executives, one of the first things that they talk about is they say it takes way too long for a developer to get onboarded and get to their first commit as a new um, employee. Um, we have customers that will tell us it will take them anywhere from six months to a year before they feel comfortable, before they're actually writing code back into their existing code bases. Um, if I take on average based on prices, and I try to do this, I give this talk all around the globe, so if I talk about $300,000 and I'm talking to a group in APAC, they're going to sit there and say, we'd never pay that amount of money. And when I talk in the U.S. and I talk about $100,000, they're like, where are you finding those engineers? So this is an average around the globe. Um, so it's also really easy to do the math. So if I've got new engineers that are coming in and it takes me six months to onboard a new engineer, I've already invested $50,000 into that engineer before they were ever even productive, before they wrote their first line of code. The other thing that we find is engineers that move between projects. So when they move between projects, if you're using best-in-class tools where every team can sort of choose their own tools, it will take them up to three months to understand what the tools are, where they should be collaborating, where the system of truth is. And so that's going to cost me $25,000 just for me moving between projects. In really large enterprises, one of the things that's really interesting when we have talked to these users is what happens to those people that are new users that move between projects in the first six months because we actually see this timeline actually even get longer. Um, the other thing that we talk about is attrition. Um, so I have a, a really funny graph that I do when I'm doing more of a comedy skit around this. Um, and one of the things that I talk about is around developer attrition 
is um, when I've got a project that I have high security, high value, and my risk is sort of a line that goes between the bottom left-hand quadrant underneath the risk is where my developer attrition bar is. Because I'm a developer who's not really doing anything fun, I'm sort of doing a lot of maintenance, I might be the mainframe developer, and those people have a tendency to either want more money, or they want to be promoted into a, a management role, or they want to move to another project where it's something that's moving a little bit faster and want to be able to uh, be one of the, the cool kids at the company. Um, so developer attrition, if I take $100,000, there's a lot of different websites out there that will tell you that it's 3x the cost. So the loss of the engineer, then the cost of recruiting, and then the cost of onboarding a new user is going to be 3x the cost of whatever you're paying that engineer. So some of the engineers that you may have that are senior engineers today that might be making $250,000, $300,000 a year, you're talking about a million dollars in loss. Um, and a lot of companies don't take that into account when they're looking at how they build developer efficiencies. The one I'm really going to dig in today, because this is one I actually helped do a study at NC State, I'm going to pull some more relevant data out of this today, is developer context switching. So how many people here are developers today? How many people do we have developed? How many of you, when you were in the office or if you're back in the office today, would get tapped on the shoulder when you're in the middle of writing a really important piece of code, you're troubleshooting, you think you've almost got it, and somebody comes and taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, you got a quick question, I got a quick question, can, can I bother, bother you just for a minute? Yeah. So that context switching is really critical to being able to re-engage or get back into the flow of where you were. The other thing that we find with the community that we talk to is there's a lot of different factors, and I'll go through them through this talk, but one of the things that's actually really intriguing to me is they will reintroduce bugs that they've already closed. Because if I'm, let's say, doing a, a problem solving and I'm on step six of problem solving this in my head, somebody comes and taps me on the shoulder and I go, oh yeah, hold on, let's go to the whiteboard, I'll draw it out for you, and I'm gone for 30 minutes. I'll come back and be like, oh man, where, where was I? And you may actually revert back to step four or step three before you can get back to where you were being able to solve that original problem. Now, this doesn't sound like, well, where does this, how does all this apply to open source? Well, when you're in open source, a lot of times you're a lone wolf. You know, you're, you're out there on an island, you fork the code, you go ahead, you're trying to make a change. You don't have somebody standing over your shoulder helping you out. But at the same time, you most likely have a regular day job. And somebody pings you in Slack or Microsoft Teams or you've got to go work on something that somebody, your manager pings you that's a high critical item. Well, now in the open source world, you had this thing that you were all excited. Man, I'm ready to go push, create my PR. I'm going to move this thing back into uh, the main code line base. And just when you're about ready to hit the button to open the PR, you get pulled away. Now all of a sudden you go back and you're like, wait a second. Well, what did I do again? Why was I doing this change? And I've even seen developers, when I talk to them uh, that are contributors to open source, they'll actually never open the pull request because they'll change their mind. They'll think it's not as important. They'll say, ah, you know what, somebody else will fix, fix it. They're smarter than me, somebody else is gonna go and fix it. And what we don't realize is every fix is critical. Moving the timeline of that change set is very important. Um, one of the changes that I had, I'll, I'll never forget this, when I was at GitHub, um, they were going from Twitter Bootstrap 2 to version 3. And I was going through and I was using it to build an, an application and I, I found this issue. And I was like, I, I, actually, I actually think I know how to fix this. I, I know what to do. And I got all excited. And I, I went ahead, I forked the code, I started making my change. And I, I w all of a sudden, I opened my pull request. Man, the maintainer of Twitter Bootstrap, all these people start, and they're all like, this is shrewd. This is so smart. Man, I wish we would have, and I'm sitting there going, that's right, I'm going to become a contributor. Here I go. And then all of a sudden, I wake up the next morning, and I get a nice little email notification. Your pull request has been closed. What? Everybody just talking about how smart I was, how awesome I am, what happened? And 
what they did is they said based on that change, they could actually refactor it at a higher level inside the code base and impact that change across multiple components at once instead of just the one component that I was doing it in. But they never even linked back to my original pull request. They never said, this is where it originated. This is where it started. Man, you know what? That sort of turned me off. And we see this all the time in enterprises as well. We talk about inner sourcing. We talk about wanting to do, get people involved and getting them engaged. And there's so many times that this, it just doesn't happen that way. So this is for all the quants in the room. So this was a study done in 2018 about context switching. So when we talk about context switching, you'll see on the left-hand side, I'm not going to read all these to you. These are the different situations that people get pulled away for. So, oh, I've got an item that has a newer due date. Hmm, okay, so let me go ahead and let me reshift my priorities to go ahead and do yours. Well, across all of these different factors, there were some things in here that I never even thought about. So there's task-specific factors, and then there's context-specific factors. The one thing that I found very intriguing in this paper, and anybody hit me up on LinkedIn or on Twitter, it's just Lee Faust. I found out on like LinkedIn, I am the, like, the only Lee Faust on LinkedIn, which is really surprising. Um, feel free to reach out to, I'll send you a link to this uh, article. Um, Self-interruption was the biggest impact. Step four. All right. <laughs> so um, the self-interruption was the biggest cause of the biggest delay of change. And so I started reading. I'm like, what, what is self-interruption? That sounds dirty. And then what I found out is self-interruption is I need, I, I need another coffee. I need, I need lunch. I, mean, I need to go take the dog out. And I was like, I never even thought about these things. I always thought about the things that happened in the office. But now with a lot of the people that were going to do remote work, there were things that they did that was actually introducing unforced change that they never even thought about. Other things that was very interesting is the different project, same project. There's a big gap in what happens when I switch projects. I did not realize today a lot of the engineers that um, uh, were queried inside of this uh, particular study, a lot of these people switched between common libraries and different projects that they worked on. They owned more of the full stack versus just owning a component in a particular part of the application. And switching even between projects, because when you look at GitLab or GitHub or Bitbucket, you know, every repo gets its own project, unless you have a mono repo where you try to put everything inside the same project. And I started thinking, I'm like, man, have we been organizing our repositories and our projects incorrectly? Are we actually inducing an unforced change that is causing you to context switch and making you have to rethink how you actually do your work. So a lot of this study, all this work and everything, we have actually got four universities right now in Europe that are comparing uh, open source and enterprises using GitLab, um, just using our core our open source product. And they're calculating measurements out of it. And they're trying to figure out how we do efficiencies uh, around how do I organize my projects, how do I create groups and subgroups, and what about my CI, CD workflow? Is it better to break them apart? Is it better to have everything all together? Um, should I be doing mono repos? You know, all of these questions that we have, because uh, we have opinions, but unfortunately opinions are, everybody has an opinion, so we thought it'd be good to be able to study it and be able to really figure out what it means. This is actually going to be a three-year study that we kicked off at the beginning of this year. Some of the data that's coming back is very interesting. One of the things I used to do as a VP of engineering is um, all of my engineers were given a block from, and this was when we were in the office, from 10 o'clock until 3 o'clock. And it was, it, no meetings were allowed to happen between 10 and 3. So my developers knew, hey, this is my block. 
And then I would tell them, I'm like, you know, you, you fit your lunch in there whenever you want to take your lunch. That's inside your block. Um, if you want to wait and maybe you're doing intermittent fasting and you want to wait and outside of that, but whatever you want to do, um, that is your block. Um, but I would not allow anybody, salespeople, marketing people, docs people, nobody could bother the engineers during that block. One of the things that we found is we closed more bugs in that block and the developers would spend time outside of those hours building features um, because they started realizing that in that block when they knew they weren't going to be interrupted, they could close out the smaller, you know, size, small, medium sized bugs they could get those out the door really fast, but if they're trying to problem solve or thinking about something new, needing to be creative, they want to do it outside those hours because they knew they were going to go away, come back, go away, come back, go away, come back. Sometimes figuring it out at 2 a.m., which I know happened to me a lot of times. So out of part of this data is... Um, we're learning how important data is to the flywheel of continuous improvement and continuous delivery. So as we think about continuous improvement, continuous delivery, that flywheel effect, and then having the four main building blocks between plan and create and integrate and verify, deploy and operate, monitor and improve, between those four blocks, we end up creating value streams. How many people here do, are maintainers of an open source project? Anybody? A few people? So one of the things I took a little bit of, um, I was listening to one of the keynotes this morning, and you know, they say developers are really good at writing code. And I'm like, that's not the genesis of an open source project. The open source projects I've been involved in is because there was a pain that nobody would agree to do internally, so somebody decided to build it externally. And there was a value statement associated with that. Number one, it's a pain that I feel when I've talked to eight other engineers and they all have the same pain. So I'm going to go build it outside my organization. We can move a lot faster. I'll go do it nights and weekends. But there's a value statement I can apply to it. I'm trying to reduce cost. I'm trying to improve security. I'm trying to make it easier to onboard new engineers. Whatever those value statements may be, you had a pain that you're trying to solve. And that's why we go write code. I don't know of any developer that goes out there and says, hey, hey I'm just going to sit down at VS Code and I'm going to see if I can fill up 10 tabs of code. You know, A lot of times what they want to do is we're trying to solve a problem. And when we look at a platform, so you see where GitHub's going, you see where GitLab's going, um, it's becoming more of that all-in-one solution. So with GitLab, you've got your planning, you've got your security scanning, you've got all of that. What we're learning is it's not about the feature functions. People really don't care what tool does the SAS scanning. They don't care how their artifact got built. They don't care how it made it into production. What they care about is the data that surrounds it. How long did it take to get to production? How many criticals did I actually package that got released into production because we created an exception for it? How do I audit and plan for that to make sure it doesn't happen again? What, how long does it take for a merge request or a pull request? How long does it take from the initial commit to actually closing it? How many people reviewed it? How many reviews required a new, a new commit or a new change? Those types of things all drive efficiencies, and when I'm able to do that from a single UI, from a single context, from my IDE all the way through to my collaboration platform, and I can see all of that, what we, what we are now determining inside of GitLab is there are two types of input. I've got manual input, so go create a merge request, go create a new issue, somebody goes and types it in. And then I have automated data that gets created. And that's going to come from my automation, my CI, CD. So I'm going to go run a SAS scan. I'm going to generate a report. I'm going to have an artifact. I'm going to have those things. All of that data needs to go to one system of record. And unfortunately, that system of record, when you try to do that yourself, you lose context. So one of the examples that I give that came out of uh, the study that we did is we were like, man, there's this one team at this company, they were rock star quality. 
Man, they were releasing, you know, four to five times a week. There were no bugs. Their code quality was A across everything. We're like, man, you guys should be like that team. Should be replicate that team because they're awesome. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we missed some context. They had one phenomenal rock star developer that was doing like 100 commit a day and understood the plan, had been at the company for 15 years, understood all the different tools, knew how to work around the system, so knew what data they were going to be collected, so made sure to write the code in such a way that it was always going to report back that, hey, we are awesome. And then there were eight other people on the team that were doing like two or three commits a week. Well, guess how data works? That person who's doing 100 commits a day all the data is going to be skewed towards that one individual. So one of the things that we have to take into account is when, if we try to extract this data and try to put it into a data lake and try to build a lake house and try to do all the around this data, you're going to miss the context. And when you miss the context, you're not going to understand where you can build efficiencies. So this flywheel effect is really critical. Think about where that data is going to come from and how you use that data to reorganize your teams. Um, I have a lot of discussions with uh, 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 new engineering managers about how do I get new engineers, like uh, people just coming out of college, how do I get them so they're committing earlier? So one of the studies that I did uh, when I was at NC State was um, about pair programming. And one of the things that we found very interesting is you would think that if I took two A students and I paired them together, that they would knock it out of the park. Nope, they became a C student. So both of them became a C student because both of their opinions had to be right, and neither one of them could agree on how to be able to solve the problem together. But you know the best teams were two B students. Two B students became an A student. Two C students became a B student. I could take an A and a C student, and they both became an A student. So when we sit there and we think about how we organize our teams and how we put these things together, it's actually really critical. So not sure how a lot of the teams today that, are, that you are organizing, but Spotify has a really interesting model about how we organize our teams. And Spotify will tell you this is not a one-size-fits-all. You cannot just go into your organization and just, hey, if you do this, everybody's going to be great. But the way that they do it is you have a product owner and you have a squad, and the squad will never have more than 10 people. And then what I do is I have multiple of those, and then I, up at the top, this is a line of business. A tribe is sort of like a line of business. And then underneath that line of business, across, I'll have, let's say, a UI, a UX team. That's my chapter. That goes across. So I'll have a UI, UX person embedded in each one of those squads. I'll have an SRE or a platform engineer that will be a chapter that will go across. And then what I'll do is between the chapters, I will then reorganize and I will collect people from different like teams that are at opposite ends of the spectrum and I will then use them to be able to reorganize and those are the people I will move between projects because then they can learn from each one of the projects. So I'll take a, a lower performing squad and a higher performing squad, I'll figure out where the chapters are, and I will take the chapter individual who helped make that particular squad a high performing squad, and I will move them over to another squad. So a, a chapter is a, like UI UX, it's an engineer, it's a project manager, it's, it's a like function across all of the different chapters, or across all the different squads. So the goal was is the way that they thought about it is you would embed that specific role in each squad. Now, one of the things that they found out is, well, it got really expensive for to go out and hire an SRE that was 100% allocated to a, particular, um, uh, to a particular squad that only released once every quarter because the SRE basically sat there and waited until the end of the quarter and said, okay, here's everything that we need to fix. So... Now what we see a lot of teams is you'll start to see this, and it, it doesn't represent very well when you're talking about people is, you know, they kind of like cut them in half or into a quarter because um, then you're kind of like, well, which quarter do you want of me? So, um, but that's really what we're seeing now inside of a lot of organizations. Now, 
from our, from our perspective, what we're learning out of open source and a lot of people who are building automation into their tooling is that uh, that is really the data aggregator. So DevOps is now becoming the data aggregator. And what we're doing is we're now creating two different teams on either side of that data. One is a platform engineer on one end who's my SRE, looking at all of my operational statistics, all my SLAs, SLOs. And then on the other side, I've got product operations. And product operations is using that data for me to understand how do I reorganize or what features of which products do I need to light up across my organization to become the most efficient. So inside of uh, open source teams, the way that it normally works is you've got four different roles that you'll play inside of an open source team. You'll either be a maintainer, a contributor, a collaborator, or an observer. Now, when we go out there and GitHub released uh, um, at GitHub Universe, they talked about the state of the universe, uh, GitHub's universe, and they'll talk about the 90 million users. Well, I can tell you as an ex-employee about 90% of them are observers. They're going out there, they're using it like Stack Overflow. Let me go out and let me go find a Rust project because I've got some Rust things that I need to do and let me see how somebody else solved this problem. And then I'll go into my project and copy, paste, and go put it into my project and see how I can make that work. Um, when we talk about the collaborators, collaborators are usually people who find bugs um, and they're coming out and they're opening up issues. Now, collaborators are the easiest to get frustrated because they're going to raise their hand and say, hey, I've got an issue. And then what's going to happen is, is that issue is going to sit dormant for about three years and it's never going to get worked on. And they're going to try to understand why nobody's working on their stuff. Well, the only way that you're going to get your stuff fixed is you're going to have to become a contributor. The way that you become a contributor is by being able to sign up to the contributor license agreement, getting your company to buy in, and then you'll have to go fix it on your own. And sometimes that's hard. Like, we get a, um, um, there's a lot of really smart developers out there, and it, it's kind of hard to get over that uh, imposter syndrome of being able to say, I'm willing to contribute code. Am I good enough to be able to contribute code to this project? And then ultimately you have the maintainers. So these are the admins of the project. They're the ones who can determine who can be a maintainer. If you're not a maintainer and you want to become a maintainer, you have to fork the project. And then to be able to fork the project, you can open up a pull request or a merge request to allow your contributions to be made because nobody wants to give read-write access to all of their repositories. Um, when you go ahead and look at this, we can apply this internally as well. So we all know, I, I joke with everybody, and I, I, I kind of put this out there inside of the enterprises that I work in, and it's really funny. I'll sit there and say, we all know where that rock star team is and everybody holds in high esteem. And I keep waiting for somebody to say, yeah, we don't have one of those. Everybody, everybody yep, yep, we are, and they can, yeah, that, that's Susan's team. Yep, yep, that's Bill's team. I know exactly who that is. I know exactly who I go to when I've got a problem that nobody else can solve. So those uh, maintainers are probably going to be less than 5% of your overall workforce. So if you sit there and think right now you've got 10,000 engineers, only 5% of them are going to be rock stars. And those are the people you can't afford to lose. Those are the people who understand the business. They understand the challenges. They're the ones who contribute the best quality code. They're the ones that everybody else is going to learn from. And then you've got contributors. Contributors are wannabe maintainers. Okay? They have ideas. They've got things that they want to get done. But the only way they can do it is to contribute to other projects to be able to get those and then your collaborators are going to be developers, project managers, people that want to interact with the community, but they're not really comfortable writing code. And then the rest are going to be observers. So um, one of those things to think about, and those observers are going to be those people that you just hired, and they're on their six-month ramp, and they're trying to figure out where they go and how they actually uh, get into contributing. So I joke because... I have to talk to a lot of people that don't know what developers do. So when I talk to them, I'm like, this is what you think a developer does, right? I accept the task. Code the task. Deploy the task. Yeah, 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 that's all our developers do. That's, that's all we ask them to do. I'm like, okay, hold on. 
Let, let's, let's dig into what your developers actually do. This is what your developers actually do. And we're going to sit there and we're going to sit with the project management team. And they're going to sit there and say, hey, I want to let you know that I think this should only take us three hours to do. And you're going to look at them and say, yeah, this is more like a three-week task. We should break this down. And then you go ahead and you've got your task dependencies, accepting tasks. They clone repos. They review other people's MRs. They've got all of the QA tasks that they need to do. All of those things. Imagine in an open source project, if you are the maintainer, this is what you do every day. And then people want to sit there and say, I don't understand why my MR isn't getting approved. Because they've got their regular job that they're doing during the day, and then they're coming in and looking at these things afterwards. So they're trying to get into your mindset to figure out how you tried to solve the problem to see if it's something they want to accept or not. Which, it, that's actually much harder. Like, anybody, has anybody here ever been a professor, um, adjunct, or um, term? A little bit? Okay, yeah, sure. So, hardest thing to do is to grade somebody else's code, right? Because you're going to sit there and you're going to say, I'm sorry, you solved this problem incorrectly. And they're going to come back and they're going to say, but it executes. And then you're going to have to look and you're going to have to, well, but there's some efficiencies. that they said, you never talked about efficiency in the problem statement. So, there's lots of ways to solve different problems. So, you have to really think about what they're actually trying to solve and when we talk about building efficiencies, this is where we need to create efficiencies. So everybody, the, the talk of the town over the last week is chat GPT. So one of the things that's really interesting is go in, and I actually did this. I, I wish I would have taken a screenshot. And I asked it to do an automated code review for me on a pull request that I had opened. <laughs> Let me tell you, my code sucks. There were like 18 requests for change that came from ChatGPT. So at what point are we going to be able to automate all these other things that we currently have to do manually to be able to move things and create a more efficient uh, workflow? Now, obviously, you're going to want somebody to check whatever it's saying that you should do. But all these things that we normally have to manually, like one of the things that it's been so busy, I wanted to go back in because one of the things I really want to do is I wanted to write a test plan for me. Because that's one of the things that I think people really struggle with is creating tests. Create me a test plan for this code. So, or give me a regression test plan. You know, be able to show me what all the different tasks are and then be able to like, have it point at an API and then ask it to do, see if it actually can figure out what that looks like. So this is very common. If you don't know this workflow by now, I've been giving this talk for whew, eight years. So this is the cycle that we think about when we're using Git and we're creating branches and being able to get feedback into that loop. And you've got your accepting your task, your plan and create on the left. You create them in GitLab. One of the differences is, is you don't need to create a commit to create a merge request. I can have an issue and create a merge request without needing a commit. So in GitHub, to create a pull request, you have to have a branch and you have to have a commit on that branch before you can create a pull request. So this way, what I can do is, in the way that we talk about it at GitLab, is this way it allows me to start a conversation. So I might have UI UX, I might have a design, I might have a test plan that I need to follow. So that way I can have a discussion before I ever even write a single line of code. So some people in the open source world, you're just moving really fast through the code. So doing a branch and a commit, sometimes that makes the most sense. So doing a PR inside of GitHub can be just as powerful. But then once you're in there, you have this loop effect. And you want to create as much automation to build as much efficiency as possible. And what we want to be able to do inside of this is to be able to get that feedback loop to the analytics and the data to the developer as soon as possible. And it has to be relevant to the current change. So inside of GitLab, we have this thing called the merge request widget. 
So if you're in GitHub, you have to go down to the bottom. You get your status that came from Jenkins, whatever is down at the bottom. If you've got sneak plugged in, that's going to come in through an issue comment. If I've got check marks, that's going to come in through an issue comment. And all those things are going to be in different issue comments. You're never really going to know what the current quote unquote state is. So inside of GitLab, what we have is your code quality metrics, your test summary, your metrics, what are all the changes. You can look at the details, look at security scans. All that data is right at a developer's fingertip. They know immediately what are those things that they may need to change. Up at the top, I can see my pipeline. I can see all the different stages with all the different jobs. I can immediately see up at the top where my code may have failed. So I can go click. If one of those little check marks is an X, I can go click on that X and it'll take me just to that segment of the failure in the logs to be able to show me where my error occurs. It's contextual. It can tell me. It allows me to build efficiency into my process by knowing where did the failure actually occur and let me go fix that. Instead of giving me when I go, I don't know about you guys, but I go to Jenkins and I sit there and I'm reading through an 80-page log file and I'm having to copy and paste and put it somewhere so I can do a fine search and look for error and hope I can find something that means something to me. And then you try to fix all of them all at once. So inside of here, all these items, and then down at the bottom, when I know that I've got a blocked merge, I can see immediately why is this not able to be merged. So I'm giving you the steps. I can tell you. Eventually, this data, we are mining and we're pulling this out based on that data in the beginning that we're talking to people about efficiency because they were telling us, I, I don't know what's keeping me from merging. Okay, that's, that's data we need to surface to the developer. Now, eventually, how soon do you think it's going to be that I'm going to see that the source branch is 322 commits behind the target branch? How soon do you think it's going to be before, before chat GPT says, I think you should go ahead and do a pool? How about I just go ahead and do the pool for you? So those are the kinds of things that we want to make sure that we surface to an engineer. Now... This is another interesting study. So the link's down at the bottom. Again, hit me up on LinkedIn or on Twitter. You can find me. And I'll send this to you. So through the Association of Computer and Machinery, how we measure developer productivity has been wrong. All the years that we thought, hey, you know what? I'm going to measure you based on the lines of code that you write. Yeah, that was wrong. I'm going to measure you based on the number of bugs you close. Wrong. There's actually this space concept that talks about the five different things that you need to measure to be able to understand how productive a developer is or not. That goes from satisfaction and well-being. How many of you have participated inside your organization, whether it be online in a community that you're a part of or inside your company, where you've done an NPS study that has asked about your developer happiness? All right, got one. Got a few people, right? I, I actually, a lot of people say, oh, that, that's all warm, fuzzy. I'm sitting there going, no, there's actually, there's some really good data that you can get out of those. You can know which projects are the projects that people want to be a part of and which ones they don't. Then we've got performance. This is the outcome of a system or process. So when I look at the outcome of what's happening from my CI, CD, those things, I've got the activity how often am I interacting with other developers across other projects as well as the project that, what does that waiting look like? Communication and collaboration, how frequently am I helping others inside my organization? And then efficiency and flow, how quickly can I get my changes out the door? This is really interesting. This is about an eight page uh, report uh, study that was done by um, a bunch of people, but one of the people was the uh, lady who wrote the original um, Accelerate book around all the door metrics, stuff like that. So really interesting study uh, to go out and read about. So with that, I will end my talk, and I'll open it up to see if anybody has any questions. Any questions? Yes. Uh, 
So it's definitely something that we are looking at. So um, uh, there's a number of items that I raise up to our engineering team all the time is we have open merge requests that have been open for like three years. And I'm like, at what point do we just decide to close it? Um, and how do I set a marker on that item to when should I reevaluate it? Um, we're looking at effective ways to be able to make that meaningful to an engineer because we do know that uh, developers will move between projects. And if that particular item, it has to be in a way that it's still relevant to me. So if I move to another project and it was something that I worked on three years ago, it may not be as relevant to me. So is there a way for me to be able to determine through AIML to know who would that potentially be important to now? especially if there's existing code and all of a sudden we're seeing the same area of code is now being investigated for change, that somebody may have already started a change that you can just rely on that was open and closed but was never merged. Those are the things that we want to figure out because there is so much code that is out there that has been abandoned. Um, we also have on the flip side of that, we also have a lot of dead code sitting in systems that we never refactor out. So again, how can I start to use AIML to be able to refactor out those things where, hey, I just ran through a security scan of your project and I want to let you know that there were 480 lines of code that we could never even hit based on the calling trees. Maybe that should just become an open merge request and I should have somebody who goes and investigates that and I can go ahead and remove it because if I'm building an in-memory tree to be able to security scan it and I can't hit it, there's no way anybody else is going to be able to hit it either. So um, all of those things are all about what we're trying to do is use that data in a way that allows us to become more efficient. And efficiency, reducing the lines of code inside of a code base, being able to figure out where people have already started a change but abandoned it. How do I move things faster through the process? There's a lot of things in the community we can learn from that we want to be able to empower and get that back to our enterprises. Yes. So time blocks is the most effective. Um, the other item that I have seen also be effective is um, uh, basically requiring somebody to self, like, like the, the hard part is we have so many tools on our desktop today. So it's like, how do I let Slack know, hey, look, don't bother me? How do I know that I don't go check my email and I got a notification that pops up that a new email just came in from my boss? Like, how do I turn off all of that noise? Um, so th that seems to be the, the biggest thing. And um, I, I used to have, when I would be coding, I used to uh, have like one of those on-air things outside my cube. Um, so I would let people know like, hey, don't bother me. I'm in the middle of something. There needs to be a way that an engineer can let other people know that, hey, I'm working on something important. Like, we all know, like, if you're trying to reach out to the CTO or the CEO of your company and you look at their calendar, you don't just go and override somebody else's meeting, right? You, you sit there and you try to find a slot. So we got to get better at knowing when our engineers are available, when we need to ask them. The other thing is, is a lot of times we ask, uh, a lot of times it's not the engineer who needs to block. It's about changing the culture of the other people who are interacting with the engineers. We need to be, get better at asynchronous. Like one of the things I love about GitLab is Slack is not a, hey, I need you to respond now. It's a, I need you to respond when you're available. And I've had Slack messages that have gone for four or five days. And then I'll respond and the first message, I get, hey, thanks for responding. You know, it, it's not them being snarky. Hey, thanks for responding. It, it's actually, I can tell it's it's an honest, like, hey, I'm, I'm glad you were able to catch up and you gave this some thought and now you were able to respond to me. It is. It's, it's a cultural thing. I talk a lot about um, a lot of the tools that we do. We bring in tools today without thinking about the impact on process and culture. And then all of a sudden, the executives want to know why all the tools that we brought in aren't bringing the business of value that they thought it was going to. Um, and I say it's because you never actually change the culture and the processes to make those tools effective. Um, 
And those are things like people think that Slack and Teams is just a way that I can ignore emails and I can get you faster. It's like, no, that's not what they're meant to be. They're supposed to be places where we can collaborate. So those are the things. I think you have to change the culture on the other side. And the way that you can impact some of that culture is by forcing those time blocks and telling people, you cannot bother me during this time. Other questions? Well, great. Well, thank you all for attending. It was great meeting you all.